Hi, and welcome to Morning Center Farm. My name is Rose Laval, owner of Morning Center Farm, a small nursery located in Northern California. This is week six of our eight week series all about herbs. So far we've talked about lemony herbs, container herbs, basils, the five essential herbs for every garden, and a little bit about ethnic herbs. This week, we're going to slow it way, way down, and we're only gonna talk about one plant. So, so far, when we've been talking about herbs, we've been making it sound like, and it's true, that herbs are easy to grow, sometimes a little rambunctious in your garden, like a mint might be, or sometimes a little joyous as far as their reseeding capabilities. So this week we want to talk about uh, something that's going to be your bragging rights in your herb garden. You, people will come into your herb garden and they'll say, oh yeah, I grow that. Oh yeah, I know that. But they're going to get to this plant and they're going to see this amazing flower and they're going to say, what is it? I need to grow this. This is your bragging rights herb. This is the herb that's going to show everyone that you have garden cred. This is capers. Camparis spinosa. So this is an amazingly beautiful perennial that is native to the Mediterranean climate. And so it definitely has a little bit of issues in certain parts of the country where it has to be kept as a containerized plant. It's good to about 15 degrees though, and so it actually will do well in most of California. This is a really difficult herb to get established. And so today I'm just going to discuss this plant. It happens to be the plant that we sell the most of for mail order. So throughout the country, we send capers all over the place. Um, along with that, we send this wonderful little sheet that describes how to grow them. But I'm hoping that this video is also going to help sort of solidify what I mean by rocks. So if you've ever seen capers in the wild, the places you've seen them is in Italy or Malta or Croatia, and they're on the side of either a beautiful castle or a rock wall or a jumble of rocks. There's some place where the soil quality is what we call poor, um, meaning non-existent. And that is what they thrive on. I was fortunate enough to be able to go to Croatia last year. And when I got to Dubrovnik, I was hoping to see a whole bunch of capers and I saw them everywhere. Even on the outside of the outer walls of the city of Dubrovnik, these plants survive and thrive beautifully, getting to be sometimes six feet long and hanging down the walls and coming into full bloom during the summertime. So they are, very easy to grow once you have them in the exact location. So I asked for a castle, rock castle. I don't think I was asking for much. And instead my husband said, you get a rock jumble instead. So um, this works um, and it works actually really well for capers. So you're going to notice as I pull this caper aside, it's literally growing out from between rocks. It is lifted up above the soil. And if I were to be tough enough today to pull all these rocks out, you would see there's two more layers of rocks underneath here. So the plant is not planted directly into our native soil. The reason for that is that it absolutely hates clay or clay loam or silt soils. It would probably do fine in a sandy soil, but most of us around here, in California at least, don't have a good sandy soil. So we're gonna fake it out and give it a really rocky type of soil. So these beautiful rocks work great to add um, the ultimate amount of uh, the ability for the plant to, to drain. Okay, so you want drainage? This is how you get it. So if you're planting capers into the ground, you are going to plant them on rocks. You're actually gonna get, get some rocks and you're gonna build yourself a nice little rock mound and that's how you're going to plant your capers. Um, underneath here, because I didn't want to spend all my money on really expensive, nice rocks since you're not gonna see them, we just have pieces of broken concrete and rubble underneath and then the beautiful rocks on top. So rocks, very essential. So I wanna show 
a little bit about capers. First of all, I'm always shocked by, here's the response you usually get with capers. See all those beautiful stamens here? So here's the male part, all these beautiful little purple stamens. There's the pistil, there's the female. And this is going to be where we get our, um, our capers from. So what part of the plant do you use for capers? I'm always shocked when people say to me, oh, capers. I didn't know capers came from a plant. I'm thinking, where did you think they came from? You know, rocks? Uh, you know, I don't know. So uh, it's always sort of interesting when people go, oh, capers comes from an herb. It comes from this beautiful plant. So you see along the stem, actually we'll use this one since it has the bloom on it. You've got capers in all possibilities. So the capers are actually flower buds. Before the plant blooms, before the buds bloom, this is when you're picking it. So you're actually picking caper buds that are small like this, or they might be a little bit larger. Oops, that one is broken, sorry. That would be even a little bit too big or right at the very top end because you see it starting to show a little color. So when you're picking capers, size matters. The smaller, the better. The non perials that you purchase in the little containers, that is the smallest size capers. They're very round. So this would be considered like a capuchin or a, a capote. This would be a larger size. They wouldn't, you wouldn't make as much money off of these. Before you think you're gonna have a caper farm and make your million, remember that you have to hand pick all of these little guys off of there. So, um, so think about that before you decide that capers is where you're going to make all your money. So we don't just harvest capers at that point though. Um, for example, a lot of us like me, I want to see this. I want to enjoy the beauty of that flower. And so you can also brine a caper at its uh, berry stage at the caper berry stage. And so I don't have any live ones here. Definitely show you a picture of one though. And where you're going to be looking, let's find us one that's finished. Here we go. So these are flowers that are done. And now they're just ready to become capers. And I'm actually gonna pull it off so we can see it a little better. So see that little piece right there where my thumb is, that little part right there? That's going to become your caper, that tiny, tiny little piece. Think of it as the same as a rose hip, okay? So it's the ovary section. This is what's going to become a caper berry, and I'll show you one brined here in a little bit. Very small. So you get to enjoy your capers at all parts of the plant, if you go ahead and brine the caper berries. So easy to grow, this plant is about seven years old and I've actually planted two in here and then a few more have taken hold. So I wanna point out a couple of things about capers. This one that we have here is Caparis spinosa bar inermis, meaning it doesn't have any prickles. And this one actually does have a tiny prickle right there. It's very, very small, but it doesn't bother me. It's very soft. You'll notice the leaves are nice and big and round on this one. Now I'm gonna show you here um, a Caparis spinosa, a regular caper. I love the spinosa that is enormous, that doesn't have any sort of a uh, a prickle on it because the plant is bigger, lusher, larger growing, faster to bloom. So let's walk all right over here and take a look at. Now this here, you can see it's far more drought tolerant looking. This is Caparis spinosa, just the species. And you go to grab that and it's got big spines on it. These are hard, these are difficult. You, you're not going to stick your hand in here very far. They really, really hurt. Yeah, they hurt. So the nice thing about this particular caper is it won't be browsed by deer or rabbits because it's darn prickly. It's like a blackberry. Um, the difficult thing for you is getting in there because you are going to want to harvest it. 
Um, so you would choose one or the other based on whether you were using it as a beautiful plant in your garden that you wanted to hang around or if it's something that you want to keep from browsing animals. The one thing that does browse it all the time that you have to work with, and really the only insect problem you're going to have, is that moths love it. So we, uh, here in uh, California, we have the cabbage loopers, the cute little white moths that everybody think is so pretty. They get in there and they'll actually chew big holes in the leaves. So we occasionally do have to spray it with BT, which is an organic, or you can just get in there and hand remove the little caterpillars from it. So you'll notice this one, is um, not as far ahead. It hasn't produced any uh, flowers yet. It's got just starting to open up with little buds right in here. So these you could definitely harvest. That would be your capers. And I know what you want to know here, which is how many capers do I get off a caper bush? So these are all about seven years old. Um, the first couple of years you'll get maybe just a half a cup quarter to a half a cup of capers. Um, and then as the plant matures, like the big ones over there, we can get up to four pounds of capers. Some people say they can get 20 pounds. I don't know how you do that, but we can get four pounds of capers off of one established plant. But what that means is that you have to be diligent. Every day you come out, you pick your capers from May through July. So you're out picking your capers every day, you're putting them in your brine. You don't wait to get gather enough capers. You do it every day. But easy to grow once established. So again, you'll notice here we have a rock. It's all in rocks. And if I, oh, if you look down in here, you can see the only kind of soil is this really poor type of soil that is actually a cactus mix. So I'm going to show you over here, we're going to plant a new one if Zena will allow us to. So here we have the area where I'm going to plant a new caper. Little shade in the morning, but in the afternoon, this is going to be all sun. So right now, I've got rocks underneath, right? I have one layer of rocks underneath. I'm going to build it up even a little bit higher. So like I said, you could put rubble, and you see there's even some broken pieces here of uh, cinder block. I'm going to plant it by putting a little more rock in here so that it's going to be lifted up even more. And it seems like this is kind of overkill, believe me, but for example, we had a big flood in here one year, and uh, it's amazing how much it helped to have these rocks here. We didn't lose any of our plants, including any of our capers, even though we had seven inches of rain in a very short period of time. Now the soil I'm putting in here is not regular potting soil. It is a specific cactus and succulent mix. You want to use this cactus and succulent mix because this mix is very granular. Um, it's not a fine mix. There's a lot less uh, organic material. There's a lot more rocks and pumice and red lava rock mixed in here. So you can see that you need to really build this up a little bit. The dogs are so helpful. If only Zena could really help. Okay, so I'm always telling my employees, we want it to look natural, like it really all landed here a thousand years ago. I'm gonna take this out. The root system is very fine. Imagine this root system is going through a whole series of small crevices where it grows native to amongst all those rocks. So you don't actually need to give it a space where it's going to have big thick roots because instead it's going to produce miles of very fine root material. So you've got as loose of a mix as possible, the succulent mix in here. You notice it's very purpley. Sometimes that means it's just a little bit lacking in phosphorus. So here we go. Just really tuck that very, very nice succulent mix. It's going to completely drain. It's sitting up even higher now uh, away from that native soil. And it looks like a fairly natural spot where a bunch of rocks just landed. 
It's not my rock wall and it's not my castle yet, but I'm working on getting that. In the seven years that these plants have been in the ground, we have never fertilized them. So remember something like capers, totally opposite from any of the herbs we've talked about. They grow in such arid climates under such poor soil conditions that really they do not appreciate getting much fertilizer. You can give them like an organic slow release fertilizer if you'd like once a year, but not much nitrogen. So you would do something like a four, five, three, and that's it. A little bit of phosphorus, a little bit of potassium once a year is plenty. This is going to not look like much for quite a while because the first thing it's going to do is it's going to put down a huge root system. So this year, we may only get three or four inches worth of top growth on it, and that would be maximum. But that's okay because what it's doing this first year, it's putting down a good root system. And for a caper plant to be successful, that's the important part. So the purpleness of the leaves tends to disappear as soon as the root system is put down a little bit. So within about two months, once that root system gets a little bit established, it really starts to take up the nutrients that it needs. And so it will green up right away. These plants, even in our climate, tend to die all the way back in the winter. So they'll lose all their leaves. We leave them just the way they are the first two years, no pruning or anything. Starting the third year, come November, December, when they lose all their leaves, we'll cut them to the ground and that gets them to be thicker and fuller each year. But for the first couple of years, you literally do nothing. You let the ugly little sticks stick, stick up all winter long. And then the following year, it just gets thicker and thicker. So remember, low fertilizer or no fertilizer, we water this rock bed in about once every three weeks in the summer, once it's established. Obviously, this little guy is gonna want water maybe once a week, every five days maybe, but still you aren't gonna love it up too much because if you give it too much water love, it will not be successful for you. So this little guy here, along with those plants there, will fill in, they'll produce tons of flowers and you can either harvest capers, which means before the flower starts to open when they're still very small, or caper berries, which is done after the flowers are finished and you let the little berry portion grow up a little bit. So what if you're on the East Coast, which we sell hundreds of these plants to the East Coast. What if you're in a climate that gets heavy snow? How are you going to grow your capers? So we're also going to show you how to grow capers in a pot so that you can actually bring them inside during the winter and keep them protected. So I want to make sure that we cover the life cycle of capers. It's a very complex life cycle and it takes a full year before you can really get the plant that's going to be able to go in the ground. So this little guy here, this has been living in this pot for almost a year. So it takes quite a while to get it from seed back up into your garden. So when we harvest the seed, we harvest it from the pod or the caper berry. This is last year's seed, and here's some extra here. Beautiful little seed, guys. So what happens with these seed, whether they're fresh or dry when you harvest them, is they have to undergo several different things before they can uh, germinate. So they need to be cold stratified, which means they have to be refrigerated or they have to be left outside for several months before they're going to germinate. So I don't like to let luck just sort of take over. Um, I'm gonna help them along a little bit. So these seeds will first be soaked in a little container of water. We'll start with like hot water, about 110 degrees. Pour it over the seeds, let them soak for 24 hours. Just come to room temp and just stay there. Then we take the seed out of the water. We put it in a wet napkin and we put that napkin inside a little plastic bag and it goes into the refrigerator for 60 to 90 days, so up to three months. After that, it comes out, it gets back into warm water for another 24 hours, we let it sit in the water, and then we put them in these plug trays like you see right here. These were put in on 
the 2nd of April. And it, we're now on the 25th of May, Memorial Day. And here you see them coming up. They take a full two to three months for everything to germinate. So one comes up and then suddenly there's five and then there's eight, but they have a very slow and uneven germination process. If you don't cold stratify them and you don't soak them in some water, you get about 20% germination. This way we can get about 90% germination. They will sit here in this kind of purpley green state for several months. So we're at the end of May now. We will get to these usually by the middle of July and we'll put them into containers. And then those containers sit until the following spring when we actually offer them for sale. So it takes almost a full year from the time we harvest the seed until it's back into a container and ready to sell. This is why I really want them to be successful when you get them into your garden because this was a long, long journey for this little guy to get back to this size. I want it to live a long life. I don't want it to, to die. So, um, so we want to make it successful as, as much as we can. I always like to point out, since we're doing these from seed and not cuttings, you get a lot of variation. So here is one that's been chewed on a little bit from snails and slugs. Snails and slugs love it too, so we have to protect it a little bit. This little guy is the same planting as this little guy. This little guy has zero roots. We planted this back in March. No roots, but you see how we take our soil blend and we mix in a lot of this big perlite. So we really make it so that it drains well. But because we have this wonderful variation, here's all these beautiful new roots. And the top part's already about six inches tall. So it's a great look at just genetic variation. This is like a really lovely source for an early, an early caper plant. So this one would be choice to go in the ground and we're actually going to go ahead and plant this one in a container today. So of course I had mentioned that caper berries are just as popular now as capers. Here is a caper berry. So this is, has been brined and what this is is here's our seed pod after it's dried and cracked open. Before it does that we let it grow to about this big. It starts very small. It grows to about that big has the seed inside of it, you can harvest it and it's always harvested with the stem, unlike capers where you always remove the stem. And then you put it in your brine. Could be something as simple as a tablespoon of salt, half cup of vinegar, half cup of water. That could be your brine. You add your caper berries to it. It's a little bit easier to uh, fill up a jar. This is one from Trader Joe's actually, but it's got full of these beautiful caper berries. These have a little bit different flavor. Capers have that really strong mustard pepper flavor. This has a little more grainy, earthy, uh, mustardy flavor to it. I love these with Bloody Marys. These are fabulous. But you'll find these on charcuterie platters with um, cut, uh, cuts of meat, uh, cheeses, alongside sandwiches, all kinds of martinis. Hello, martinis. Um, and even just uh, alongside a salad or as part of an appetizer. They're really fun, fun to use for your cooking. So that great kind of mustardy pepper flavor, but a little more earthy with a little more texture to it at that point. So you can, you can harvest for this purpose. For us, we mostly have to harvest for this purpose because we need thousands of seed for uh, the next year. This year I think I have a big enough supply that I can actually brine some of our own, which is gonna be a lot of fun. So we're gonna plant this up in a container now. We've seen how you do it in the ground, but a lot of people aren't going to actually have ground where they can build up a little bit of a, of a rock garden, or they're gonna be in an area where they need to be able to move that plant inside to protect it in the winter time. So here's one important thing. The deeper, the better, okay? So even if it's a little bit narrower, like this is a little bit narrower pot we're gonna put in, but it's nice and deep because those roots like to really reach downward. So what I'd really like this to be is 
filled with rocks. But let's face it, no one wants to lift a giant pot that's filled with a lot of heavy rocks. It's just going to be too heavy. So we're going to concentrate on using, again, a really good mix. You're going to make sure you go in and you use a mix that's specifically for succulents and cactus. You're not going to stratify the soil. I know that some people will, uh, will put in like empty pots or some lightweight um, material that they think is going to make it a lot easier and lighter weight. Let's see if I can actually lift this up. It's Memorial Day, so I'm trying to take the day off, you know. I'm already thinking about my Bloody Mary with my caper berries in it. Okay, so pretty lightweight soil. It still makes the pot pretty heavy because you've got more grit, more pumice. I still like to do a little bit extra. So again, when you feel this, you notice how it just falls apart. There's a little bit of moisture, but unlike potting soil, it doesn't stick together at all. Okay, so that's really important. So I'm gonna do one other little thing, and that is I don't trust it quite enough, just a plant by itself, so I wanna add a few rocks. Find the rocks. I had them here. Just like to make it so that it has to drain a little bit. So even though we have a soil mix now that's very lean, that has a lot of rock material in it that's going to drain very quickly, I still feel better if I can just give it like a little bit of extra love, a little bit more drainage. So I'm going to come in and just add those couple of little rocks in there so it can rest against them. And even though you're not really going to see the rocks, it's just a little bit lifting. So you've got something hard, kind of what that plant is used to, against the main stem. Of course, you're going to leave a nice space for water. Not a lot of extra love. In a pot, you would maybe fertilize it twice a year. If you're in the cold season area, of course, you're not going to want to fertilize it right before you bring it in. But um, if you're in a warm season climate or in California, then you could do it very early in the season and about mid-September also. Again, it would be light, a little bit of fish emulsion. Think of my, maybe it's a, getting it from that sea mist maybe, in the Adriatic Sea or the Mediterranean. But not much fertilizer, just a little bit. This pot, you're going to water this pot in. Because it's a new planting and it doesn't have roots all the way down to the bottom, it of course isn't super drought tolerant right now. So we're getting ready to have a 100 degree day tomorrow. I'll probably have to water this now and I'll probably have to water it in about three days. So not constant love. You don't want to keep it constantly wet. You want to let it dry down a little bit. Once it's established, so give it about two months to really put that root system in, then you're going to water a pot this size only once a week. Not very often. I wouldn't plant a lot of cute little plants around it. I know it's not very attractive right now, but when it fills in, it'll be full and beautiful. It's a cascading type plant, so imagine that plant cascading all the way down. So just give it a chance. Make sure that you just remember that this is a plant for patience. You know, all of our gardens now, we're all clicking by, clicking by, next day delivery. This is a whole year from seed to just a little plant, and it's another year from this little guy to something that's gonna flow over. So this is the case where you are learning humility and patience, but in the end, you have some great bragging rights. You go, oh yeah, capers. I saw them when I was in Malta and I just had to have one, so here they are.
So give yourself a chance and really love this plant. It's a great one to add to your herb garden and you'll find yourself brining it and really enjoying watching a lot of the butterflies that are going to come to the flowers. So thanks for joining me this week, learning all about caper plants. Next week, we have to talk about my favorite herb. Well, after lemon verbena, we have to talk about my favorite herb, lavender. We grow so many varieties, it deserves a lot of discussion. So we'll see you next week.